Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, my name is Michelle, and I'm with the Revolution Club, and I'm also with Rise Up for Abortion Rights. Um, and I want to welcome everybody to um, this program with Sansara Taylor uh, speaking on Overturn Row Helm. And I want to give a um, shout out to everybody tuning in from across the country. I want to give a shout out to people, a small group of people that are watching from Revolution Books in Harlem. Um, and welcome people to Revolution Books, even as we're doing this program virtually. Um, you know, Revolution Books is um, all about a real revolution, right? This is what this bookstore is about, and it aims for nothing less than the emancipation of all of humanity. And it is a bookstore with books, forums, and critical engagements about the world, as you're gonna hear tonight, um, and for a whole new world. And it's the intellectual, cult, uh, political, and cultural center for a movement for an actual revolution. And at the heart of this bookstore is the work and leadership of Baba Vakian, who I am a follower of, and, you know, Sansara Taylor as well. Um, and Baba Vakian is the most important uh, political thinker and leader in the world today. Um, and I would like to invite people in New York City to drop by Revolution Books um, and to, you know, check out the books, to uh, be become a, a, a sustainer of Revolution Books, um, to be able to have these kinds of very important engagements and discussions in a moment where the world is moving and changing, when people are look, people are taking to the streets, where people are looking for deeper answers to, you know, why are we in a situation where, you know, it seems like Roe versus Wade is um, gonna be overturned, right? And and the potential to actually stop this, um, and you'll hear more about from, you know, Sansara Taylor, who I am going to be introducing. Um, but yeah, I wanted to welcome people. And um, so what, what the program will look like tonight is um, I'm gonna introduce Sarah Taylor. She's gonna give uh, a talk. And then I wanna invite people watching on YouTube and Facebook to drop your comments. And as she's speaking, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, drop them in the comment um, box. And you know, then we're gonna move um, after Sansara speaks to um, hearing from you all, you know, reading your comments and questions and having a little back and forth here between myself and Sarah Taylor. Um, but while before Sansara starts speaking, I do want to call on people, share this video and call on everybody to tune in right now to share this to Facebook groups on YouTube, send the link um, and tell them to to get on this this video right now and watch Sansara Taylor speak on these critical uh, questions. So with that, I want to introduce Sansara Taylor who is who will be speaking tonight. And Sansara Taylor is a co-host um, of the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show on YouTube. She is a co-initiator of Rise Up for Abortion Rights, and she's a follower of the revolutionary leader Baba Vakin. All right, thank you, Michelle. Back in 1964. Speaking on Sproul Plaza at the University of California, Berkeley, Mario Savio, a student leader in the free speech movement, made a statement that has rightly become remembered and often quoted since. He said, there is a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even tacitly take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears, upon the wheels, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. So I ask you tonight, right now, as the US Supreme Court is on track the highest court in the land in the most powerful country in the world is on track to decimate women's fundamental right to abortion within a matter of weeks to slam the half of humanity that has been born female violently backwards. Is this not such a time? If we let the US Supreme Court go forward and overturn Roe v. Wade, 
Over 20 states immediately ban or severely restrict abortion. And that's just the beginning. More extreme bans are being introduced and passed almost by the day. In Ohio, just a couple weeks ago, Republican Jean Schmidt introduced a near total abortion ban. When asked, what if a 13 year old girl was raped and became pregnant as a result of the rape, would this child be forced to have her rapist baby? Jean responded, quote, it's a shame that it happens, but there's an opportunity for that young woman, no matter how young or old she is, to make a determination about what she's going to do to help that life be a productive human being. An opportunity? These people, these fascist lunatic haters of women have their hands on the levers of the state. Is this not such a time that is so odious, a time that makes you sick at heart that you can't take part, that you can't even tacitly take part? In Louisiana, Republican Danny McCormick proposed a law that would give full constitutional rights to a fertilized egg at the moment of conception, full personhood, and would charge a woman who gets an abortion or anybody who assists her with homicide. Arrests, handcuffs, prison, and yes, the death penalty for women who decide they do not want to be pregnant for whatever reason, or maybe just women who have a miscarriage. Is this not such a time where you've got to put your body upon the gears, upon the levers, upon the wheels of the apparatus and prevent it from functioning at all? And let's be clear, banning abortion will affect all women and girls, not just those who are victims of rape or incest, not just those who develop life-threatening complications during their pregnancies. Forcing women to have children against their will forecloses their dreams, it shatters lives, it drives women and traps women in poverty and abuse. This affects poor, impoverished, Black and brown women especially hard, but it affects all women, even women who never become pregnant. It makes them unmistakably aware and it tells all of society that they are viewed in the eyes of the state, in the eyes of the patriarchal male supremacist society as nothing more than baby making machines, that their lives and their humanity doesn't count. So I ask you again, is this not a time for everyone who cares about women and girls and everyone who cares about justice to rise up and to indicate to the people who run this society that unless this is stopped, this machine, their society will be prevented from functioning at all. Indeed, it is such a time. And this is why it is so important. It is so uplifting, it's so inspiring, and it's so hopeful that there were powerful outpourings last weekend in hundreds of cities across the country, standing up, rising up for abortion rights, and why it is so precious and so inspiring that there have been waves of youth walking out of school across this country, from Kentucky to Colorado, to California, to Tennessee, to Arkansas, to New York City, to all across this country, young people who have walked out of class in middle school and college, and most of all in high school, and especially young women, furious women, terrified about their future, but turning that terror and that fear into powerful fury in the streets. And it matters so much. But I will say this here tonight, as beautiful as this is, as promising as it is, as inspiring as it is, it is not yet enough. This has to go higher and it has to happen quickly because it is not enough for people to voice their outrage once. It is not enough to rail against what the Supreme Court is threatening to do to the lives of women and girls for generations to come. We have to make it stop. We have to stop them in their tracks. We have to bring forward such massive society-wide struggle and resistance building on what's come forward, but going much, much further that they are made unmistakably clear that if they go forward, their society will be brought to a halt. We need more students walking out. We need campuses emptying, college campuses too, not just the high schools. This needs to spread. We need professional athletes wearing green, 
and calling on people and joining the people in the streets. We need all the celebrities, all the prominent artists who signed that beautiful ad. It was good that they did last week in the New York Times with Planned Parenthood, standing up for abortion rights to come out into the streets and use their platforms and their influence to call people forward in struggle now, relentlessly. I've heard that there are dozens of corporations that have already, many of them headed by females, already said that if Roe is overturned and abortion is banned and, and there's where their employees live, that they will pay for their employees to travel to states that have abortions. And there's something positive in that, but it is not nearly good enough. They need to give their workers a day off to walk off the job and join people in the streets. There needs to be bringing this society to a halt again, not just for a day, but again and again in growing numbers relentlessly. The freeways should not run. The bridges should be shut down. All of society needs to be brought to a halt to say, we will not accept, we will not allow it to go forward for women to be violently enslaved by forced motherhood. And that's what this is. That's what we're facing. So I wanna say everybody watching, everybody tuning in tonight, wherever you're watching from in a group by yourself, you have a role to play in this. You have a big role to play in this. Not just yourself participating, which you definitely should, but in stepping in and becoming an organizer and fighting for others to become involved as well in reaching out to all sectors of society and mobilizing others in sounding the alarm and being a moral example by acting yourself and insisting that others join you. Do not underestimate the danger, the horror, the nightmare that will come if we do not stop this from going down. And don't let anybody prettify it for you either. This will be a nightmare for women and girls, and it will accelerate a whole fascist direction in this country that is coming for the rights and the lives of so many other people. But also do not underestimate our power, our power that has just begun to be indicated with the outpourings we've seen, the strength that we have when we stand up with the right on our side. Do not underestimate what you each of you watching can contribute to this and what all of us can do together if we throw down right now. But I wanna say, and I'm gonna spend some time on this, that right at this moment, when the Supreme Court has leaked their draft and it's clear that they're going forward to overturn Roe v. Wade and slam women backwards, right now when the danger could not be more clear and when the potential force that is mighty enough to stop this has been revealed at least in part in these powerful walkouts and protests that we've seen. Right now, the need is the greatest to stay in these streets and step up this struggle. There is a louder and louder drumbeat, a louder and louder drumbeat, almost deafening, coming from the Democratic Party politicians, from the mainstream media, really the bourgeois media that is mouthpieces for them, and by the so-called leaders of the so-called pro-choice movement who are slavishly tied to and subordinated to the Democratic Party, the louder and louder drumbeat insisting that really the most realistic thing right now is to take our fury, our energies off the streets and to channel them once again into voting for these Democrats in the elections in the fall. And there could not be a more deadly piece of advice this is something that is warned about in an important recent article by the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian, who, I'm a, who I am a proud follower, follower of and who is also the architect of the new communism. He has written an article that's available at revcom.us called The Supreme Court Moves to End Abortion Rights, Taking to the Streets and Refusing to Let This Go Down. Bob Avakian speaks to this critical juncture in the fight for abortion rights the road forward and avoiding dead ends. And indeed in this piece, Bob Avakian does go into the critical juncture that we are at in the fight for abortion rights right now, this juncture, the road forward. And he goes deeply into what are the dead ends that we need to avoid and why they're dead ends. And I cannot recommend this article strongly enough. It's at revcom.us. It merits study, not just reading study, spreading it, discussing it with others and taking it to heart. There is so much science and so much essential leadership in this article. So I'm gonna draw from it very heavily and the rest of my remarks here. 
So why would it be deadly to listen to those telling us the most realistic thing to do is to go for the elections in the fall? For one thing, voting for these Democrats in November after the Supreme Court has ruled is too late. We need to stop them from delivering this overturning of Roe. We need to stop them now. It is far harder to win a right back after it has been lost than to defend it while you still have it. Voting for the Democrats in the fall is too late. So that's reason number one. But here's another thing, and this is something B.A. points to, Bob Avake and B.A. in this piece. He says, voting is not the fundamental way that any advance for the oppressed has come about. This is not the fundamental way that rights and the expansion of rights in this country have been won. To cite a very clear and obvious example that he cites, even the right to vote was not won through voting. Even the right to vote was not won through voting. It was won through people standing up, through marching, through struggling. People went on hunger strike. People went to prison. People faced down white supremacist mobs and tear gas and uh, fire bombs. People put their lives on the line for black people to vote. And yes, for women's suffrage, the same. This was a huge struggle. And the same is true for all of the fundamental rights and the advances that people have won, even when those rights are later codified, that is written into the law. Even later, if the, if the government does pass uh, a, a law, a resolution, or a court case that grants officially those rights, fundamentally the reason why that happened was the struggle of the people. And the same is true, as he points out in this piece, for the right to abortion. It had everything to do with the upsurge of the 1960s and 70s, including the women's liberation movement. This is a lot of why the right to abortion was won in the first place. As the great abolitionist leader and former slave Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. So this is the second big reason. We have to wage struggle to defend the right to abortion. It's not gonna come on the cheap. But the problem with relying on the Democrats goes even deeper than this. The truth is, and this is well-documented further in this article than I can get into in this talk, but the Democrats have actually actively aided this assault on abortion rights over decades. This assault on abortion rights has been driven by the Christian fascists with, who are now at the core of the Republican Party. It's been driven by that wing of the ruling class and a lunatic social base that they have cultivated. But at every point along the way, the Democrats have conciliated, capitulated, and actually facilitated this attack. For decades, they have repeatedly sought common ground with those attacking abortion, seeking common ground with those who would use the state to hijack women's bodies and take away their freedom and their ability to control their lives. Who could have common ground with forced motherhood? There's no common ground with female enslavement. And yet the Democratic Party insisted on this and disoriented and gave misleadership to generations of young people and others to seek common ground and to be demobilized in the face of this assault. The Democratic Party has even gone so far as to run anti-abortion candidates in the name of seeking common ground. And they have at every point handed over the moral high ground to these Christian fascist lunatics who would enslave women. A, a concentrated example of this is the phrase that Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton used for years, as did most of the Democratic Party and most of the so-called pro-choice so-called movement. They said abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. And it's important to think about what is the implication of saying abortion should be rare? The implication is there's something wrong with it, something undesirable about it. What it does is it gives the moral high ground and the initiative to these fascists who are demonizing women who get abortions when in fact there is nothing wrong with abortion. It's perfectly morally acceptable. Fetuses are not babies. And it is a very, very good thing, not a bad thing, a beautiful, a great thing for women to have control over their reproduction, their bodies, their lives, their destinies. That's not a bad thing. That's nothing to apologize about. We, abortion does not need to be rare. We need abortion on demand and without apology. This is what we need to fight for. And this gets to another thing that the Democrats will not say 
and have refused to talk about it. Most of the so-called movement won't either, which is that the fight over abortion is about controlling women. It's an attack on women, on women's very humanity. It's not about babies. As I said, fetuses are not babies. And if they cared about, quote unquote, stopping abortions, they would be the biggest proponents, the fascists of birth control, but they oppose that as well. So it's not about babies, but it's also the Democrats like to say abortion is health care. Everybody's heard that abortion is health care. It's a big rallying cry at the rallies last weekend. And of course, abortion is health care. But clinics that do abortions have not been bombed because they're health care. Doctors who do abortions haven't been assassinated because it's health care. Other fields of health are not being targeted in this way. Abortion is being targeted. Yes, it's healthcare, but it's being targeted because abortion gives women control over their bodies, their destinies, and their lives. And it's that that the fascists hate. It's not healthcare in the abstract. It's women. It's women's control over their lives and their bodies. It's women who are under assault. Another thing you hear a lot is this is an attack on bodily autonomy. It's an attack on every person's bodily autonomy. They want to take over people's bodily autonomy. But it's not an attack on bodily autonomy in the abstract, which is not a, it's, it's actually a questionable concept in the way it's used anyhow. But the fascists who are coming after abortion, they have no problem saying my body, my choice, when they want to oppose a vaccine mandate that saves lives. They have no problem saying my body, my choice, when they refuse to wear masks and they get in your face. They don't have a problem with bodily autonomy in the abstract. They have a problem with women. And this needs to be said. It needs to be named. We need to call it out. There are haters of women who want to control and subordinate women. And the Democrats won't say that. And I want to say this because this goes in the movement too. Of course, it should go without saying, but it doesn't. So we'll say it. The vicious, bigoted attacks on LGBTQ people and on trans youth in particular need to be vigorously opposed and fought against. But at its essence and its core, the assault on abortion is not an assault on trans people. It is an assault on women. And the fascists will tell you this. They're very upfront about it. I remember the first time that I ever defended an abortion clinic. It was under siege. It was the only abortion clinic up in North Dakota. It was in the 90s. And the Christian fascist fanatics, the terrorists who were out there, the ones who were laying siege to clinics and, and associated with the whole climate where, where, where doctors were getting murdered, they did this prayer outside that clinic. It was, Lord, please break this curse of independence that has afflicted women. They see that abortion has given women control over their bodies. I keep saying this because it's true and it's so little understood. Abortion is about women. It's being attacked because they hate the freedoms, the relative freedoms women have won. They want to drag women backwards. I've seen this at the only abortion clinic down in Mississippi too, 10 years ago. The fanatics out there were screaming at us, all the typical things. And they were saying with it that everything started to go wrong when women got the right to vote. Women should not vote, their husbands should. Two or three weeks ago, I was in Kentucky where they effectively banned abortion in the entire state, the first state to do so. It's temporarily suspended, but that's still on the books. And we were there <clears throat> and the Christian fascist fanatics who were out countering us got in our faces and said straight up, women should submit to their husbands as their husbands submit to the Lord. It's in the Bible, Ephesians 5.22. They preached this. I challenged the guy. I said, okay, you believe the whole Bible? He said, yeah. I said, what about in Deuteronomy, where they say that women who are not virgins when they get married, who can't prove it with a, with a bloody sheet before the men of the town, all the men in the town should come out and stone that woman to death until she dies. And this man said, well, yeah, adultery is a sin. It should be a matter of civil law. You know, he, he straight up upheld that passage. These are people who hate women, okay? This is not about anything other than that. And we have to name women. And I want to stay on this just one more minute, because I know this has been wildly controversial. And a lot of people with very good hearts keep coming to the protests and they keep changing the word woman. And they keep saying pregnant people or people in general. They change the chants. They change the speech. They won't say the word woman. And sometimes if you ask them about this, they say, well, Abortion doesn't only affect women. 
It also affects trans people. It also affects people of color. It also affects the poor. It also affects blah, blah, blah. But I want to say this, is that this argument that it doesn't just affect women, so let's name everybody else, assumes either one of two things. It either assumes that everybody knows it's about women, which is just not true. Millions and millions and millions are brainwashed to think it's about a quote unquote baby, to not to see the only life at stake is the life of the fetus and to erase the woman entirely. Or it assumes that well, people know it's about women, but there's such little respect and care for women in this society that we have to sell abortion rights by making you think it matters to other people too, which is Actually, unfortunately, too true. There is way too much tolerance for misogyny, hatred of women, brutality against women, shaming of women, all the all the abuse that women still live with. But the point in the face of that is even more reason it has to be called out and challenged and fought against. So we need to say this is an assault on women, on women's lives. This is a fight that we need to take up because it has everything to do with whether women will be treated as full human beings and actually win their emancipation. Yes, as part of a broader society-wide struggle to emancipate other sections of people as well, which I will get into. So we have to tell the truth and we have to unleash the fury of women, the pent up Suppress long suppressed fury that burns in the hearts of millions and millions of women and girls across this country that we have begun to see erupt. But there is a fury, and you've seen it erupt all over the world, that burns in the hearts of women, whether it's on the surface right now or not. It is a powerful force against the thousands and thousands of years of traditions chains, the thousands of years of the ways that women have been treated as punching bags, as property of men as sex objects, as objects of sexual plunder, as baby making machines, as the butt of a joke, as less than fully human, as servants. Women need to be that fury at all of that over generations and generations is a powerful force. And right now it needs to be made manifest. We need to call it for, we've begun to see it. It needs to go further. We need furious young women all over in the streets and in all the other places, women of all ages. And we need everybody who cares about justice standing with them. This is a powerful force in waging this fight. And it needs to come out into the streets right now. Tomorrow, there are walkouts nationwide. Next Thursday, there's a nationwide shutdown that's been called by Rise Up for Abortion Rights. There are ways to manifest this together with others to puncture society and call for many more people. And beyond that, we have to do more than even these two days. We have to build sustained, growing, mass struggle that really does make good on stopping society. That is so much more powerful. It will matter so much more to those sitting in the halls of power than going and casting your ballot for these Democrats to give them their your approval as they go and capitulate and conciliate again and again with these fascists. <clears throat> so I wanna say that it's also necessary to confront the even deeper reasons the Democrats continue to act the way they do and can only act the way they do and why the elections under this system can never be the means through which people affect real change. Bob Avakian goes deeply into this in his article as well. He exposes the reality that these Democrats are representatives not of the people, but of the system that rules over the people. The system of capitalism imperialism. And their primary role, the primary role of these Democrats is to keep people believing in this system and keep this system functioning smoothly. And even as it continues with its oppression of women, its white supremacy and other oppression, its massive relations of exploitation, not just in this country, but even more around the world, keep people believing that if they just keep voting for these Democrats, they just keep working within the terms and the limits this system gives them, there'll be some hope for change when it actually, the system's very nature, the limits it gives you are precisely geared to a system that cannot be changed, it cannot be reformed, and the Democrats cannot do other than operate on the basis of this system. And I wanna quote from him in this article. He says, an essential reason for the Democrats increasing capitulation to the fascists is this, 
While the fascists are determined to rally their base behind lunatic views and their aggressively oppressive and repressive agenda. And they eagerly welcome the ways this challenges and tears up the established norms. The Democrats are dedicated to an increasingly failing attempt to maintain those norms and to continue trying, even as they fail, to overcome the divisions and polarization in society. This is an orientation and an, and an approach that is bound to perpetuate very real horrors, including male supremacy, as well as white supremacist oppression, brutality and terror, and to continually give rise to even greater horrors. So going into, going fully into why only a real revolution can solve this and why the sharpening divisions among the rulers not only hold the potential for tremendous horror, but also could provide the openings to bring forward a real revolution and open the door to a new society on the road to real emancipation. Going into all of this is beyond the scope of what I can engage fully tonight and get into here tonight. But I want to invite you and I wanna challenge every one of you who is watching to not only ask, but to seek answers and to act on the answers to these big questions. Why is it that 50 years after women won the right to abortion in this country, is this right coming under such sustained and now existential attack by Christian fascist lunatics at the highest level of the state and throughout society? Why are we still living in a world in 2022 that drips with white supremacy from the ongoing unrelenting police murder and mass incarceration to the rising vigilante and mob violence like this horrific massacre in Buffalo just a few days ago? Why do we live in a society and a world that is ravaged by imperialist wars and is now flirting with World War II that could go nuclear and take all of human civilization with it? Why is it that despite summit after summit and all the honeyed words of many politicians in this country and around the world, we are still accelerating under this system towards the destruction of our planet? And what does all this have to do with the system we live under, capitalism, imperialism? And could there be a different world, a different system, a different way beyond all this madness? Could that be real through a real revolution? And how could we make such a revolution? I wanna urge you to ask these questions and to dig for answers and to dig into the work that Bob Avakian has done where you will find profound answers. You can find the work he has done at revcom.us, the website, including the article I've been highlighting tonight. And also we bring this to you, rooted in Bob Avakian's leadership and the, and the new communism that he has forged every week on the RNL, the Revolution Nothing Less show, which I co-host together with Andy Z at youtube.com slash the Revcoms. I urge you to subscribe, to watch every week, to spread that and share it with your friends. And I invite you and urge you to learn about and get into and join the Revolution Club to powerfully represent for this revolution, to fight the power and be part of transforming the thinking, lifting people's sights towards revolution as you learn more about this yourself. To the youth who are so righteously furious that they have been born at a time when it seems there is no hope for the future, you do not have to be denied a future. There is a way out and there is a basis for hope and daring and a scientific foundation. That is my challenge and my invitation to everybody of all ages. You will find that in this revolution. At the same time, in closing, I wanna emphasize that for all of us, truly all of us who care about women and girls and everybody who cares about justice, whether we see or are coming to see the need for revolution and the possibility and the import of being part of fighting for this revolution, or whether you are still convinced that this system can be reformed into something that meets the needs of the people, and you are gonna vote for these Democrats in November. Wherever you fall on that spectrum, we need to be out in these streets. We need to be standing shoulder to shoulder. We need to be rallying more people to stand up right now to stop this Supreme Court from overturning Roe v. Wade and decimating women's right to abortion. This is on us. There is no other force. The Democrats are not going to do it. Nobody else is going to do it. 
We are the ones who have to get out there. We've seen the potential power. We have to call it forward. We have to double down. We have to pull out all the stops and we have to do this now. We have to aim very high. Tomorrow, there are walkouts nationwide called for by riseupforabortionrights.org. They need to be powerful. They need to be massive. They need to be ferocious and they need to continue to spread. Next Thursday, May 26th, riseupforabortionrights.org has put out the call for people coming from very different perspectives united in this, put out the call for people to leave work and school at noon, to go into the streets with your, if you're a musician, bring your instruments. If you're an athlete, bring your team. If you're a religious congregation, bring it all out there in the streets together. Teach your class in the streets, everybody into the streets. If you're on the freeways, drive real slow and bring it to a halt on the, on the bridges and the tunnels everywhere in society. People need to bring this society to a halt and launch even greater, even greater levels of struggle, mass struggle and refusal to let the Supreme Court get away with taking away women's right to abortion. Together, let's really make good on the orientation that as I began, this is a time when the operation of the machine has become so odious has made us so sick at heart that we can't take part. We can't even tacitly take part. And we've got to put our bodies on the gears and the levers and the wheels upon all the apparatus. And we've got to call forward others to join us and we've got to make it stop. And we've got to indicate to the people who run it, the people who own it, that unless we're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. So let us stop the Supreme Court from decimating abortion rights and let's do this as part of building up the strength and the struggle on the side of the people to win a whole better world. Thank you. Thank you, Sansara. Um, so before we start, um, you know, before we begin some back and forth here, I wanted to encourage people um, to drop some comments um, to write your comments, write your thoughts, write your feedbacks um, to what Sansara just spoke to. Um, and we'll be able to read it here and get into it deeper. Um, so people should take the moment now to do that. I also wanna call on people to donate, to donate to Revolution Books and we'll pull up right now on the screen how to do that. Um, to be able to continue to have these kinds of discussions and, and, and forum, to, you know, talking about the world and how it's, you know, moving and changing. There you go. So here's the information on how to contribute to Revolution Books um, and to continue to visit Revolution Books, right? And, and actually, you know, uh, be part of sustaining this bookstore to be able to have these discussions and conversations in a moment when people are looking for answers, when people are coming out into the streets. And as Sansara spoke, right, like there is a way to actually understand that. And there is a way to actually, you know, learn and, and get into where this all comes from and the real solution to get to a world where this is no more, right? Um, and I also want to call on people to donate to Rise Up for Abortion Rights. And we'll pull that up on the screen too. Um, to be able to, you know, these beautiful walkouts and these images that you've all, I'm sure you all have seen of these walkouts the past two weeks of youth and students out in the streets, you know, and, and, and then the May 14 marches that brought everybody together, right, out into the streets. This needs to grow. This needs to be strengthened and it needs to be sustained. So people should donate. People should sign up. Um, and and spread the word to you know get other people to actually become part of you know this movement rise up for abortion rights to be in the streets and to shut bring society to a halt you know we do have to stop this supreme court from overturning roe versus wade and that's what this organization is about so people should take the moment to do that um and and then there are some questions um so people should continue to, to, to share this video, to put in their questions um, in, in, in the question box. Um, I'm gonna take a second to, to read this. So I think this, I, I mean, I'll say, um, Sansara, 
this is one thing that I really appreciate your, you know, what you just walked through in, in, um, in your speech. And I think this question of like, um, not talking about women or trying to, you know, actually has come up every time, right. And being out in the streets and, you know, and these, are, this is coming from people that actually care. This is coming from people that are in the streets out with us. Right. And so I think, you know, um, I thought this point of that you made about it assumes that people know that it's about women. And then when you think about like, even just drawing from my own experience being like really anti-abortion, I never stopped to think about like uh, women until I was actually challenged that women's lives get do get foreclosed, that there's an actual person there whose lives just get destroyed because they're denied the ability to control their bodies and they're denied even the choice to you know to have an abortion you know and 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 it just made me think about it you know that you know it, it isn't actually like a lack of inclusion you know when we don't you know it, but actually what is this really about you know so I just want to I'm just thinking about that and and how there is a lot of people that really do care who really are raising this as a real concern and real question and I think this is why I think it's really important to open up that question here. And I think even calling if there's students, if there's youth watching this, we want to hear from you, you know, put, drop your comments in, in, in the comment box. We want to hear what you think on this question and we can continue to get into it here. You know, actually uh, for the sake of time, I did not include it, but in my draft, Michelle, you should know. And I think it's worth everybody um, who's watching knowing I actually wrote you into the draft because your experience, which you've shared with me and had the courage to share publicly, um, which does take courage and it takes a lot of ideological clarity, um, is it concentrates what a lot, millions and millions of women have gone through all over the world for generations and generations, literally thousands of years. So when we were in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral in February, when riseupforabortionrights.org was doing protests trying to wake people up to what we knew was coming and what the whole women's movement, quote unquote, knew was coming, but wasn't doing anything about, which was the Supreme Court ruling. We did a speak out at St. Patrick's Cathedral and, and um, uh, really calling out all the institutions that have patriarchy in them and the Supreme Court, but also including the Catholic Church. So that's why we were there. And Michelle, you spoke and, and you got up and described growing up in a home where your mother experienced violence in the home and being taught, she was brainwashed by the Catholic Church, and as were you, to believe that it was a sin to leave that abuse, to get a divorce, to leave the marriage. That's the brainwash of the patriarchy. That's the, and not just a brainwash, it's the structures, it's the relations, it's the force of patriarchy in people's lives, and it's millions and millions. Why was she, your mother, the one who was sinning and doing wrong? She was being abused. But that's the teaching of the church, the patriarchy. And similarly, you were very indoctrinated. You spoke about this um, with the anti-abortion view. And when you thought about abortion, like so many, you thought about only one life, that of the fetus that you thought was a baby. And I remember when you first, when we first talked about this, or actually it was the second time, I don't remember, I don't know if you remember the first time, it was when you were still very anti-abortion. Um, but uh at least you had the courage to talk about it, you know, but um, one of the first times when you had begun to kind of reprocess, you said, you know, you had a, a friend who got pregnant in high school for the second time. She already had a baby and she was in an abusive relationship and she came to you and asked for help to get an abortion. And you said no. And you weren't because you thought there was a baby being killed. You only thought about that life, the fetus. Um, and it was years later, and you were talking to me, uh, and years later, you said, um, I never thought about her life. It just never occurred to me. I never saw the woman. It never occurred to me. Her life didn't matter. And I think that's so common for so many millions. And I think people need to, they need to recognize that's not, that's not, you know, ancient history. That's not, a, a, a you know, back in the you know, 1950s or in the 1300s, people used to think this way. This is millions of people's lives right now all around us. And if we don't talk about the women, then A, we're not telling the truth, but we're also not fighting to change 
and wake up the fury that can be unleashed. I mean, in, you're a, you're a good example of that, but you're you're not unique in that. There are so many people who've lived through this who found their way through that shame and suffocation to standing up and fighting against it. But you don't get that if you don't hit it, if you don't call it out. And right now, at the very moment that women are the frontal, uh, the under frontal assault as as never before to erase women, to not talk about women, to not stand up and talk about the lives and the humanity and the worth and the import of women's lives is whatever your intentions is to facilitate that attack because you're disarming people about it. So I think it's very important. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up. And, and like I said, it was almost in the speech, but it, it didn't fit. So I, I figured we'd bring it up at some point. Um, I see there's some questions here. Let's see what people are saying. Yes. Yeah, so um, somebody writes, I read an article from an OBGYN um, doctor, also an abortion doctor, that in the state of Alabama, there are doctors who right now are not treating women who have miscarriages because they are afraid of the state. <clears throat> and uh, this is something that's happened already in Texas. There's been stories about this where Texas abortion is banned at six weeks. And women who come in with complications and maybe they're miscarrying um, and they need for medical reasons an abortion, the doctors won't do them or they won't speak the word out loud because they don't want it to be recorded by anybody. Um, and they're afraid of legal persecution if they actually give life-saving treatment to these women. And it's very, I have to say for the doctors, you, it's wrong to capitulate to that. Better to treat the woman and save her life and then fight the case and rally people to support you than to capitulate in advance. One of the ways we get to a fascist nightmare is people capitulate in advance. And I'm not making light of the, of the danger and the stakes that doctors are in and women are in and others are in, but let's be real. What we're gonna face if we don't stand up against this is 10,000 times worse. Talk about homicide charges for a doctor in Louisiana. Let's stop this. Let's fight this. Let's get our fighting backbone and spirit. But it is what's going to happen. And there's a woman, Savita Halapanavar, who became very famous internationally because she was in Ireland when abortion was completely banned. And she had a miscarriage. And it was obvious that the fetus was not going to live. And she was getting sepsis. She was getting poisoned by it in her body. She was in the hospital, but the hospital in the country was anti-abortion was Catholic and they wouldn't give her the life-saving treatment because the, there was still cardiac activity, electrical activity that they call it a heartbeat. It's, it's not even a heartbeat at six weeks. By the time it was in Savita's body, I don't know how developed it was, but the fetus was dying. It was being miscarried, but it still had electrical current. And so the doctors would not help her terminate that pregnancy. And she died. And the whole world watched it happen. They knew the doctors knew it was happening and they wouldn't give her the treatment. So what's being described in Alabama is very much the direction things go. Um, and it's and it's a nightmare. The doctors should not capitulate to that now. And we have to it's all the more reason we have to fight now to not let this become law. <clears throat> So this is a, something really good that came up right now on the on the comments. Somebody's saying, "I expect mass protests this summer if Roe is overturned. We we won't be stopped," which is a good sentiment. Um, and I think um, I think where you started your speech, right? We have to stop it, you know. And and it actually, you know, even the point of like it does get us, it does put us in a better position if we don't actually capitulate, capitulate to it now and actually allow it to be reversed you know we don't want to be fighting a battle where Roe is overturned and then we get out into the streets or we mobilize but it actually does the aim is to not lose it right yeah. and and to actually um strengthen have a stronger people in, in case they do and actually they put th that this becomes a rock that they drop on their own feet if they actually do overturn Roe versus Wade right um, yeah, I think that's extremely important. We have seen, uh, we don't need, look, if they take it away, if they overturn Roe and, and ban abortion, there absolutely should be society-wide mass protest and shutdown. 
But we need to aim to do that now. We really need to aim to do that now. We have to fight with all we've got to stop the court from doing this. I did a radio show last night, and I will say there was a caller um, who was uh, had a tremendous amount to say, and he it was very insightful. And he called in and he said, you know, um, first he said, this these are laws that would, like I began in the speech, a 13-year-old girl who's raped. And these people would say that the, the girl should be forced to carry her rapist baby and live her whole life with the trauma and the, and the horror and the nightmare that that brings. And he was just livid. He just really made it very graphic and real. He was very on point about this. And he said, there needs to be a million woman march. He goes, you know, there was a million man march. There should be a million woman march. Because if they do this right now, it's not the law. If this gets etched into the law, those are the words he used. If, if this gets etched into law, he said, there is a world of hurt. Then you're in a different game. If that's where we end up, then we have to fight. We are not giving up, but you don't want to end up there. I, all these people who say, well, I don't respect the Supreme Court anyhow. I don't respect the Supreme Court. They're all, I, they have no authority over me. We're still going to always have the abortion pill. We'll mail it to them. Oh, there's always other means to go around the pill, blah, blah, blah. Okay, look, there's a lot of people who got away with smoking marijuana for many years, okay, when it was completely criminalized and never got arrested. Or if they got arrested, their parents came, they bailed them out. It wasn't that big a deal. But millions and millions of Black people's lives were fucking crushed by this. How many people, 19 years on a, on a stupid bid, you know, for a time, because the law said it was a crime. The state has fangs, okay? Yes, some people will slip through. There are always some people who slip through, okay? But most people get caught up. And if the state takes away the right to abortion and you start criminalizing it state after state after state, most women will not get that pill through the mail. What about the 14-year-old girl who lives with a patriarchal tyrant of a father who can't get to her mailbox? What about the, the, the woman living in her car who doesn't have access to the internet, let alone a mailing address? What about the fact that they're going to make it a crime and put you in jail if you mail the pill? What about the state, okay? What about the shame and the isolation? And what about the fact that all women have their lives degraded? The state says you're not fully human. That has meaning. That has repercussion. I'm, I'm so sick of these people talking like it's not going to be that big a deal. Oh, I don't respect the court. I don't, I don't respect the court either, but I know they have real power. That's why you have to go out there and fight it. And if you don't respect it, then make its power not have the same bite by calling for the fury of people to stop it now. We have to stop it now. So as much as I, I really agree with you, Michelle, the sentiment is right. If they, if they overturn Roe, let's not stop. Let's not stop now. Let's stop them. Let's stop them. And we have the power to do that. We might not win. I'm not selling an absolute here, but we have a fighting chance. And now is the time to fight for it. You're in a stronger position now than you are later. Yeah, somebody said some states are talking about banning plan B, all hormonal birth control, IVF, et cetera. All of that is true. All of that is true. So this is where it goes. You know, they're not going to leave they're not going to leave. Coco Das gave a great speech um, at the rally last week, and she's um, a writer and on the editorial board of Refuse Fascism. And she said, um, you don't hand these fascist lunatics a victory and think they're going to leave the rest of your rights alone. You have to fight them. You have to defeat them. So what else do we got, Michelle? Uh, I was just gonna, yeah, I was gonna go to that that comment because I was just talking to somebody yesterday who was sharing with us that she's somebody who went to, I think she said DC, and she did like a lot of work around the time when Plan B was actually like six hundred dollars and like was so like not even the place where it is now where it's like over the counter where you can just get it right. And she was talking about the struggle that it even was to get plant, you know, and how she was thinking about a lot of people that take these these things for granted. And even it made me think about what, where you started this point that's made in the in the the those the I keep saying speech the article from Baba Vakian on you know taking to the and refusing to let this go down 
about like even the right to vote was not won through voting. Like it actually was people in the space. It actually was people like fighting to, you know, to get something like Plan B, to get something like, you know, um, to access to abortion, you know, and 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 it just made me think about that and just kind of like she was bringing alive, you know, she knows the the struggle and what it it happened in order to have something like Plan B. And they're about to take it away. They're, they're fighting to take, you know, abortion and all this away. And she's saying a lot of people just don't even think about what all the struggle was to actually win these rights. And we actually do have to bring this reality to people, you know? It just made me think about that as I was reading that um, this comment from this person about they're really quickly going to take this away, but then the fighting chance of like, we actually do have to continue the struggle, the, the, the righteous struggle that people took to actually win the rights to win the right to vote, to have all access to all all these, um, you know, to 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 these resources, to these things, to like get an abortion, right? Um, I'm just looking at the comments. Sorry, we have a, a question. Um, two questions. I believe this is from somebody watching at Revolution Books in Harlem. I want to give my special love to Revolution Books, to the staff, to everybody in the house right now. Um, and I see your question, so I'll read this and I'm gonna see Michelle if you wanna say anything about it. Uh, it's a, a, She writes, first, how can it be that priests have sex with children and are not punished for that while the church wants to take away abortion rights from children? The second question is, why does everything fall on women? Yeah, I think um, I always have a lot to say about the church, but um, I was thinking like a lot of people think about these things as hypocrisy. Um, and I think like what Baba Bacon speaks to in this this piece again is like even this Christian fundamentalism, right? And like taking the Bible literally and actually like fighting to to implement that to to law, you know, and even like this this thing of like what it means for for um you know, I was thinking about, as you, as you were giving your speech, I was thinking about like what your point about when we went to Kentucky, right? These people, like these rabid, like, you know, fascists were in our faces and they were like, you know, one, one of them was like reading Bible verses, like, you know, um, uh, counter protesting us, right? And others were like in our faces and they were saying these things. And one of them was just kind of like, you know, um, like you, why are you here? You know, like you need to be at home with your husband. You need to be submissive to your husband. You shouldn't be out here like asking for these rights. You know, you need to like just shut up and obey your husband, you know, and like all of these things. Like when I started um, breaking with religion, I went to the Bible and I one of the first quotes that struck me was I think it was Genesis when like they create the woman. Right. The the um, the woman that comes out of the rib of the man. And then he says something like, you know, um, she has to be sub submissive to her husband, to her property owner basically you know and 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 give him children you know and like when you think about that like fighting to make that a reality for every woman in this society right when you take away abortion rights when you take away you know uh birth control then you are reducing sex to just be about reproduction then you are trapping all of these women in these situations where they are forced to be submissive to their husbands where they are like, for, you know, forced to like, uh, 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 you know, just give birth to children against their will, you know? And it just made me think about that because a lot of people think about like, and if we try to fight these things on the terms of the Bible and on the terms of religion, it's not actually the, the right kind of, the uh, you know, it is gonna, it, it is what Baba Bacon is saying, like, I mean, it's, it isn't, you know, it just made me think about this thing of how the Democrats have reached across the aisle, realms, right? You're, you're accepting the terms of these fascists when it comes to religion. You're accepting, you know, and, and, and if we take on the same way and we try to go at them on the question of religion or accepting the terms that they're putting forward, it's, it's not going to go well. You know, a lot of people try to argue out like, no, that's your Bible says this, my Bible says that, your God says this, my God says that, but no. Like we actually do have, and it does come back to the point about women, the lives of women. What is it gonna mean when, you know, when you actually do take something like the Bible and you like, 
take it literally, you know, the stoning of women for not being virgins, the 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 murdering of LGBTQ people for you know uh uh for, for being gay, you know, like this is what the Bible actually puts forward, and it isn't just hypocrisy, like these people are actually fighting to make this, you know, to put this into law and to have people be forced to 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 live this way. Yeah, I, I, I think that's extremely important. I want to say, um, you know, and it's in the spirit of what you're saying. There are many religious people who support the right to abortion. And so the dividing line is not, do you believe in God or not? Are you religious or not? It's, are you going to let this, the state take this right away? And are you going to stand up now and fight it? So that's number one. But within that, I, I also, I just want to build on what you're saying to say, and, and go with this question, why does it fall on women? is that to really understand where the oppression of women comes from and why we need a revolution to end it. We have to look, it's not human nature. It's not men's nature to be domineering, possessive. It's not women's nature to be more nurturing. And, you know, men can be nurturing, women can be nurturing. It's, it, you know, they're, they're, it's not women's nature to be docile and submissive. Actually, if it was, they wouldn't have to have all these laws and uh, brutality to enforce women's submission, okay? The fact that they have to do it through violence actually shows you it's not in the nature of women to be that way. It's people are people. But um, you, the control over women's reproduction, the insistence in the Bible and then in society that women be virgins before they get married, and then that women have children as their prime duty, which is written into the Bible, um, all of that is a reflection of the certain way that society has been organized into different, it, ever since society has been divided into different classes, oppressor and oppressed, um, exploiting and exploited classes where some rule over others. There's been a division that, that has required control over the rearing of each new generation, whose children belong to who, who's going to inherit what property. If you're sharing everything and living collectively, it doesn't matter that much. Everybody cares for the children together. Um, you care for the well-being of the next generation. Um, and yes, you might have particular relations with your particular offspring, a closer bond, but it's not one like, this is the child that matters, those other child children are not mine, they don't matter. Um, so with the uh, division into different classes, the control over women's reproduction started to matter to society as a whole. And this is where the myths, and they are myths, the myths that are in the Bible were made up by societies that really needed to control in order to know if I'm a man, who's, 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 um, who will get my property? I want to make sure I know which children are mine. I need to make sure that the woman I marry is a virgin when she gets married, that she's never had sex with anybody else so that she only has sex with me. And I know that my, the children she had belong to me. And that is then part of patriarchy. That's part of how you're controlling women. And it's not, it's in the interest of, of maintaining the divisions in society. Who's going to be the next generation of slaves? Who's going to be the next generation of rulers, of warriors? Who's going to get property? Who's going to be left out? And it still goes on today. We don't live in a slave society, we, but the family is still the economic unit and the social unit of society. Children survive and thrive or end up on the street or in foster care based on whether who their parents are, who their family is. And that is determined by the mother who, who bears the children. And so there's all this control over women on that basis. It is, and, and so this, this has been taught by the church. It's been institutionalized and, and all class divided societies, including the one we live under now, capitalism, imperialism. And, and it is the core reason why, to answer the question, why does everything fall on women? Because that structure of oppression is built into the economy, the social fabric, the culture, and the ideology of society. But it has not always been this way and it does not need to be this way. And this is why a revolution that overthrows this system and gets beyond those class divisions. So we actually are communism from each according to their ability to each according to their need. We are living cooperatively and caring for children and the next generation collectively. You can actually have the freedom 
doesn't automatically mean you still have to wage a fight against patriarchy, against male supremacy in its own right. You have to wage that struggle. But with a different system, with a real revolution, you have a, a framework, a mode of production, a way society is organized where you can go to work at this and start making leaps and advances. And this is what Bob Avakian, he goes into very deeply in his work overall. There's a compendium called Break the Chains. Um, Bob Avakian on the liberation of women and the emancipation of humanity that's at Revcom and in revolution books that goes into this. And then in the constitution for the new socialist republic in North America that he drafted, um, it lays out concretely how not only will you have women's right to abortion um, and control over their lives in this way built into the constitution, you'll have a society that backs women and others up as they go up against changing attitudes and, 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 oppressive views towards women that are still left over in people's thinking. So it's a very important question. I'm kind of just, you know, indicated some, some of what's involved in it. I know there's a lot more questions. So let me, let me stop there. Yeah, there's like two really important questions. I think they're related. Um, one of them says, um, yes, yes, this is about control and enslaving women. I think many still are not clear about the death of the vicious, vicious repression that will come down. Can you speak more to how we reach more, we reach more with the reality of what these fundamental fundamentalist Christians have in store? And then there's one from the staff at Revolution Books, which is something that they're running up against. They're saying, um, could you speak to breaking this question, breaking this open among black women and black people? Heavy conservatizing effect of the church, even for people who are not religious, the history of forced sterilization and experimentation on enslaved women, et cetera. Okay, well, let me start with the second. Um, <clears throat> a lot of, first of all, black women need the right to control their bodies and their reproduction. Black women should have control over their own reproduction and lives as much as any other section of women, period. Okay, um, there is a tremendous history of shame and control uh, and over women, black women's bodies. I mean, the whole history of this country is, is black people as a whole being treated as chattel, as, as, as property is less than fully human in the most barbaric and brutal ways. I mean, it's just indescribable. That's where the wealth of this country came from. It's through slavery, generations and generations. Um, but within that, black women were, were really treated as, as chattel and readers of chattel. And so the idea of being forced against one's will to have children is really one of the most barbaric parts of the history of enslavement in this country. Um, and that is, the, that is what black women would be returned to. Uh, the forced baby making machines is really an ugly thing. And so I wanna, you know, sometimes you hear people say, uh, a number of things. You hear people say that abortion is a white woman's issue, which is not true. It does affect white women and that matters. Um, we can't have a narrow or revengeous view. It affects all women and that matters. It's an oppression and we should fight it in every manifestation, but it does hit black women particularly hard um, for a whole host of reasons given one disproportionately um, black women get higher rates of abortion. And it is largely because they have poorer access to health care overall, to sex education overall, to birth control overall, and end up in conditions where they need, where they have more unplanned, unwanted pregnancies, not because of a moral failing, but because of societal oppression. Um, and the idea that they would be denied these abortions will hit black women in, in even magnified ways for all those same reasons. It'll hit anybody forced to have a child against their will is a nightmare, but women who are forced to have children against their will and they are already have the deck stacked against them, it's gonna take a higher toll. And the final thing I wanna say about that is that black women also have, I think three or four times the rate of maternal mortality in childbirth that white women do. And so the actual life-threatening danger of that is also through the roof. So this is gonna hit all women and it will definitely hit black women the hardest, especially when you bring in the level of criminalization and, and, and the police and sending women to jail for their pregnancy outcomes that all forms of criminalization absolutely hit black and brown people hardest in this country. So that's number one. You also hear people say that black women getting abortions at disproportionate rates, these anti-abortion, you know, really, really ugly um, 
really ugly propagandists will say things like black women are committing genocide. You know, they say the most dangerous place for a black baby is in the womb. And they, what they do is they play on the legitimate sense among black people broadly that they are under attack and there's a genocide going on. But instead of blaming the system, instead of standing up against the police terror and murder, the mass incarceration, all and fighting to get rid of this system that has white supremacy steeped into it, they blame black women and use this to fuel a movement that would actually reduce women back into baby making machines. So all of that needs to be rejected. And I think, you know, we do need a lot more struggle against the church overall. I said before, you can be religious in this fight. You can be religious and be in the revolution and you should be, but we also have to get real and have some struggle over this because the evidence shows there is no God. And the evidence shows that the creation and the myths of God and religion have been forms of convincing the oppressed that they should accept their oppressed conditions and they will be rewarded in the afterlife. And it's also been a way of preaching and justifying why we should put up with all kinds of horror and oppression in the world today, including what we talked about before, the shame on women, the blame on women, the sense that women are, are the ones who have done wrong if they're abused, if they end up having to get a divorce, if they end up getting an abortion. And there shouldn't be no shame on women who go through these things. The shame belongs on the patriarchy and those who enforce it. And there is great power in standing up against this. And there is great fury to be unleashed, including from all women, but yes, including from black women, a tremendous wealth of fury, righteous rage that needs to be unleashed and directed as a powerful force, a very powerful force in this fight right now. It's, it would be a very beautiful thing the more that comes forward. I just, that's very important. What else? We got a bunch. We got um, a comment and a question. The okay. comment says, um, preach, Sansara. We need to think outside our own worlds. And the I like question. that, not outside the box, outside this world. And I think I'll take that to mean outside the terms that the system puts on us right now. We need to think outside of it. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And the question I think is related because um, the question says, you came out strongly against voting. What concerns me now is the suffering women around the right to choose and control their body. All the poor women who will suffer when fascists in power do we all walk away from the squad? I don't think voting is the answer, but sometimes it is necessary. Well, I think, um, so you're talking about the squad um, for people who, excuse me, um, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, the, the squad, there's that little cluster of women of color, Congress people who are sort of like the very left progressive plank of the Democratic Party. and. Um, you know, it's a it, two two levels to answer that. Um, fundamentally, this the squad, no matter what their intents, if they are playing by the rules of the system, they are going to reinforce the system. They cannot do anything other. It's just a fact. Um, so, in the deepest sense, it it's a different path. It's a different road. And actually we could get into the, the unrealisticness of much of what they put forward as solutions. But right now, I think what I want to emphasize even more than that, and that's important and that's a conversation we should have, but even more than that right now, I want to say vote for them. If you want to vote for them, that's not the most decisive question at this moment. What it would be deadly is to think that's enough or to think that's the most important thing. And I think, you know, it is for all the reasons I've said it, it, the elections are too late. We have to stop the court now. The way you change what's, what, what this court is doing is through struggle from below. The way you change this fascist direction is not by voting in new faces. It's by waging struggle. I was talking to somebody the other day um, and making the point that Richard Nixon was so far to the left, so far to the left of any Democrat who's been in power in my entire life. And the reason for that is not that he's a, a lefty, but because it was strong. He, look, he pulled out of Vietnam 
That was the administration that expanded welfare. There was all affirmative action. All these things that are now under attack, under attack, under attack by the fascists today. The, a lot of this came in under Richard Nixon. And that was because of the mood and the struggle and the demand from below created conditions where he had to concede things that he wouldn't have otherwise, that, that the whole ruling class had to make concessions on things. Not as a matter of individual volition, but as a matter of how do they preserve their legitimacy? Or you go back further, you go back to Lyndon Johnson passing the civil rights legislation. Now, I know there's a lot of fictions and a lot of people like to make these stories about how he grew and had a change of heart and became such a ch changed man. But 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 he was a Southern segregationist. He was a he used the N word in the White House routinely. He was not a friend of black people. That's not what changed. The struggle of the people changed. And because people were standing up from below, because they were shining a light and drawing a line and saying, we won't live with this segregation and lynch mob terror anymore. We're going to stand up. Because of that, the whole world saw it. Before the world could look away and, and say, oh, America, it's such a democracy. Look, they have all these rights. Everybody's so happy. But you start to shine a light. You start to make the world see it, just like we did with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. When we stood up, the whole world was looking. When the whole world started looking and saying, oh, you don't look like the leader of the free world when you have black people hanging from trees, then the rulers had to step back and they had to make some changes. And even somebody like Lyndon Johnson had to make some changes, okay? This is how the world, this is how, I'm not, we're not trying to change the hearts and minds of Samuel Alito and Amy Coney Barrett, who are stone cold Christian fascist, uh, Clarence Thomas, we're not, people say, oh, you're, you're so naive. You think you're going to change their minds? No, we're not going to change their minds. But what we can do is we can change what they're compelled to respond to. And we can make it clear to the fascists on the court and to every other ruling institution that if they go forward with this in the face of massive, massive outpouring from below, unignorable, visible to the whole world, unrelenting, unstopping and growing, that if they go forward, they are going to be left without a shred of legitimacy in the eyes of millions, not in the eyes of a handful of radicals, who if you're a radical and you don't think they're legitimate, I respect it, I'm not making light of that. But in the eyes of millions and millions, then they have, then they have to worry about how they can keep their society functioning. And in the eyes of the people of the world and governments around the world, they have to worry about their soft power. They have to worry about their standing. That is the power that we have out in the streets. That is a power you will never have in the ballot booth. And in fact, as B.A. goes into it again in this article, which is really important, he says elections are not the means through which decisions are made. They're not the means through which it's done. They are primarily a mechanism to control and channel people's thinking onto the terms of the system. And then through the people's participation in these elections to stamp the rulers with the mantle of popular legitimacy. Oh, we're doing this because the people wanted us to. And so they never let you vote for something else that, you know, really represents the fundamental interests of humanity. They never let you say, you know what, let's dissolve the military. Let's go off fossil fuels and let's vote tomorrow to make sure that, that everybody has uh, a place to live and food on their table. You know, you vote for that, their, their whole economy gets thrown out of whack. They can't let you do that. OK, so they give you very narrow things you can vote for. And then when you do, you pick the less evil among them. They say, see, we're only doing this because the people wanted it. No, that's the terms of the system. You get played every time. But out in the streets, you have the power to actually bring, to compel them to respond to our demand, to take away their legitimacy, to bring forth the power of the people, which not only has a fighting chance to stop this court from doing what it's poised to do, it will not be easy, but it's a real chance. It's the chance we have to fight for now. It will put you, if they go ahead, it will put you in the strongest position to keep fighting. Because one thing that happens, if they do this the way they did Texas, in Texas, they, they banned abortion and nobody said jack shit about it. They let it go down. It's viewed as legitimate. Now the goalpost is moved. Now they're, now they're adopting it in Oklahoma and Idaho. They're adopting the same laws. Now 15 week ban from Mississippi seems reasonable because Texas has a six week. It was legitimized in the eyes of millions. Whereas if it had been massively protested and it went ahead anyhow, then you inflame more outrage. Then you inflame more strength of the people potentially. 
that will still be struggle, but you're in a stronger place to then fight forward and compel other ways that abortion will be secured for women. And the third thing you do by standing up, you not only have the best chance of winning this fight now, and you're in the strongest position if you don't win it, you are also building up the strength of the people because there's a whole fascist juggernaut, not just this fight around abortion, but all of it. You need the strength of the people against all of that. And you need to be building up the understanding and the organization and repolarizing society towards the real solution, which is an actual revolution. Out in the streets, debating the way forward, standing together as we do, this is what's needed now. So if you wanna vote for the squad, I'll have a, an important struggle with you over why that's not a solution and why it actually ropes you back into the, the same system that's doing harm. But, but to go ahead and do it if you want to do it. If you feel that's important, then do it. But don't tell yourself it's more important than being in the streets. And don't let anybody else believe that either and fight for others to be out in the streets. That is what is most decisive. Yeah. I mean, this question came up again on, on the comments, right? They're saying if all women went and voted against the Republicans, they could be driven out, right? And I think it, you know, it's exactly what you just said, right? Um, and I think this is like an important, you know, where we come together in the streets and actually stopping this, right? Like here we have a, a, a small, when we're not talking about years, we're not coming like, you know, we're not talking about like, some abstract time that the Supreme Court, like the Supreme Court is, have said, and they've like given it to us in like written form saying, we're determined to overturn Roe versus Wade, you know? So here we have a small like window to actually, you know, I think your point about like creating the kind of movement and the kind of, you know, uh, um, society that is brought to a halt that every force is forced to respond to this, including them, right? And actually, don't have the freedom to just overturn Roe versus Wade. Like that's where we have to all come together. And then, yeah, and then let's come back and let's get into these questions, you know? And I wanted to take this opportunity to continue to invite people to come to Revolution Books and get into these questions more deeper, you know? Um, I'm a part of the Revolution Club and I'm here in New York City and every Sunday we're at Revolution Books um, having these Revolution Club Sundays where we dig into um, the work from Baba Bacon and the, the Sunday we're going to be getting into this pamphlet, right? Taking to the streets and, and refusing to let this go down, right? From what Sansara was just, you know, um, uh, pointing to in her speech, right? So it, all these questions we should be getting into, why fundamentally is voting not actually the solution when it comes to like the emancipation of all of humanity, you know? Let's get into that, you know? Let's get into like, what has gotten us to this point, right? There's a, a another talk from Baba Vakian, something terrible or something truly really emancipating that actually does get into why this is a rare time when revolution becomes possible, right? Let's dig into that together. At the same time, as then we go back out into the streets and we call on more people to, you know, to actually, you know, get out there, right? And part of why I think these questions are so important is because exactly like um, in the title of the talk, right? Baba Vakian speaks to this critical juncture in the fight for abortion rights, the road forward and avoiding dead ends. Like we do have to talk about how this, you know, how relying on this and saying that instead of being in the streets, we have to just rely and put all of our efforts into voting is a dead end. And this actually, this, you know, is this movement is not gonna spontaneously grow. And if it gets led in that way, it is, it's, it's not gonna go where it needs to. And we're gonna end up in a really bad place, which is accepting and capitulating to you know, uh, there's the Supreme Court overturning Roe versus Wade. So we do have to get out there in the streets, all of us, right? Everybody watching, everybody that has put their que their questions up on here. Let's get into the, in, out in the streets. And tomorrow, there's a very important walkout that students um, are organizing. And, you know, nationwide, wear green, wherever you are, wear green, support, you know, get out there with these students in these walkouts and you know here in new york city we're going to meet at union square and we're going to march a week ago there was 2000 students we marched to washington square park and we had this really beautiful scene where these youth just jumped in the in the fountain and just like you know started having fun and and being out there with their bullhorns and their signs and this is the, the there's a joy to actually standing up and fighting for you know for for women to not be enslaved you know and that we saw that last week and we're continuing, you know, we're continuing to fight for this. And so tomorrow, 
um, there's a very important walkout. And then as since I said, Thursday, May 26th, shut the country down wherever you are at noon, leave work, leave school, you know, converge and march, right? Um, and again, this has to continue to grow and let's continue to get into these questions, right? Um, so that we are out there and we're not just like pulled in 20 different directions about like, you know, we're gonna get told that this isn't the way to, to do things. And we have to be, you know, we have to be like our eyes on the prize, which is stopping the Supreme Court from overturning Roe versus Wade. That's why we're all in the streets together. That's why we in the Revolution Club have been out there. That's why Sansara Taylor, you and others initiated this organization exactly to prevent the Supreme Court from, you know, enslaving women, you know, and so that's where we all come together. And I think that's been the beauty of like having these discussions and these forums and having Revolution Books post that and continuing to get into this beyond just tonight, right? So I just wanted to say that real quick. Yeah, I, I want to piggyback on that to say um, for everybody watching, the, the website rise up number four abortionrights.org. Um, there's a sign up sheet if you have not signed up yet. Sign up, say where you're watching from, and uh, what you can volunteer to do. Maybe you can make a donation and really give a big donation, give as much as you can. It really matters right now, it matters tremendously. Um, there's bandanas to spread, stickers to spread, flyers to spread, promotion to do. There's so, this needs to, we need to actually be able to be putting ads all over the place to reach people. There are so many people who are burning with an outrage right now. And so many people who need to be woken up, that part of them needs to be woken up. We need to reach them very quickly. So give a big donation. If you can give a thousand dollars, please give a thousand dollars. If you can give $25, give $25. If you can ask your friends to give $2 each and raise 20 together, then do that. Everybody can give something. So that's number one. Two, there's um, volunteer. And there are flyers on the website. There's a drop down with materials. You can print them out um, at your home printer. You can take them to a print shop and print a lot of them. Take them to a high school. There's a lot of high school students responding right now. Take them to the theater. The Broadway shows, let's reach people who have their tickets to the theater. Let's reach people in the transit hubs. Let's take them to the churches and the synagogues and the mosques on the weekends during services. Take them to people you know, take them to people you don't know. Spread the flyer, spread the sticker, reach out very broadly, put it on social media. And if you have particular skills, if you're a web designer, if you're a graphic designer, we definitely need graphic designers. We need a web, we need people to join our web team. We need writers. We need editors. We need people who can proofread. We need people who know how to do sound equipment. We need people who could put on a huge benefit concert if you work with musicians. We need people who are reaching out to celebrities and major influencers and working with them to spread the green bandana and call on people to be in the streets. We need all sectors of society, people who can reach professional athletes or college athletes every level of athletes. We need people reaching out and working together to bring in other sectors of society, dancers, teachers, healthcare professionals. People need to come into this, you know, and everybody has networks they can reach to. And there are ideas you will have, creative ideas you will have. Somebody asked before, how do we wake more people up to the emergency? There's a lot of creative ways already going on and there's more that we can come up with. A lot of the young people have been marching with wearing the bloody pants and carrying the faces of women who die. You know, we did emergency protests when Lizelle Herrera was arrested just a few weeks ago in Texas for allegedly inducing her own abortion, arrested out of a hospital. This is the future. We need to put this in people's faces if we don't stop the court. Fortunately, she had the charges dropped, but massive damage was done to her. She was put in, in jail on a half a million dollar bail and demonized and shamed in front of the world when she was suffering, you know, this is, this is criminal and it's the future of what's coming. So there's gotta be creative ways that people get involved and, and sound the alarm. But most of all, you have to stand up and you have to tell everybody, you know, and reach out to people. Last night, there was a, there was a zoom. We did a zoom with a, a bunch of young people who have led these walkouts around the country and are planning more. And there was a student from Seattle who said, you know, I think I've been, a little too polite when I've been spreading the word about the walkout. And they said, you know, I kind of go up to people and say, if you have time, 
Could you be involved? If you care about this, would you do that? And it's how everybody's trained to talk, you know, especially young women are trained to talk this way. They don't want to be intrusive. They don't want to be too imposing. That's not polite. But this is not personal. This is not a favor you're asking for people. It is objectively the case that unless we stop them, the Supreme Court is going to revoke a major fundamental right of half of society and bring a world of hurt, a nightmare down. And if you're not acting to stop it, you are letting it happen. And so everybody's going to get out there and now is the time to stop it. And it's not going to stop voting for the Democrats. It's going to stop if we wage struggle. So you got to go tell that to people straight up. And, 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 and if people are clear on that, if you are clear on that, and if you make others clear on that, then people will find all kinds of creative ways to get out in the streets. But there are also, like I said, there are flyers, there are fact sheets, there are resources on the website. Um, if you need help with anything, write in with your questions, tell us what you need, and we will do our best to, to bring people together to help solve problems. Um, but it's an all hands on deck moment. So I really want to, I would just want to piggyback on what you were saying. Also from the person who asked about the squad, they say being in the streets and being visible is essential to change flesh not digital clicks, 100% true, 100% true. You gotta be out there, it's gotta be real. I mean, use your social media, use your clicks, but use it not as your excuse, I did something, but use it to get other people out there. Let people know, show yourself in the streets on your social media, tell people where they should show up and uh, spread the videos that Rise Up for Abortion Rights is putting out and spread the videos the, the RNL, the Revolution Nothing Less show is putting out. That'll have a big impact on, on reaching more people. We've done, I will say, we have done incredible coverage of this battle on the RNL, the Revolution Nothing Less show. We have done unparalleled coverage, analysis, and provided leadership and clarity on this abortion rights emergency when no one else was talking about it. And this is because Bob Avakian has been on this question like, like laser you know, for decades, he has been very, very keen recognizing this rise in Christian fascism and how central this question of abortion is to the whole position of women in society. And, and it has everything, his leadership has everything to do with why I've, why I've, I mean, I got into his leadership through the, through being woken up to the abortion rights emergency in the nineties. But actually the reason I've stayed on this and been such a fighter on this and seen the, the basis to bring forward mass struggle around it has everything to do with the leadership he's continued to provide. And we bring that in the show. And so watch it, spread it, get other people to watch it. That's a thing that'll have a huge impact on this country and the culture, on the movement for revolution, but also for the resistance more broadly. The Revolution Nothing Less show is a must watch. Um, so people, if you have more questions, please send them in quickly because we're getting towards the end of our time. We're not there yet, but we, if you have anything else that's, that's on your chest, you just, you've been holding it back, but you, now's your chance. I'm giving you your warning. We're gonna wrap it up soon. Um, I was just gonna say on the, on the RNL show, um, mm -hmm. like this is a, a really important way that people can actually learn more about the revolution. And, um, and it's, you know, something like I mean people watch I know people that watch YouTube for hours you know um and you know people should actually watch there's like I think it's 101 episodes at this point so there's there's a lot of you know I think what you're speaking to important um speaking to this question but also like the world you know what the situation and what's happening in ukraine right now you know the you know the the, the works of baba Baki and like the environmental emergency like all these things that people need to understand and and, and actually uh um learn about um and i'm pulling up my flyer because the at revolution books the revolution club hosts watch parties of the show every Friday. So people should come, people in New York City, come to Revolution Books every Friday at 6 p.m. And Revolution Books is at 437 Malcolm X Boulevard. And, you know, to come watch it together and, and spread it and be part of discussing the, um, these questions after with the Revolution Club. All right, well, you know, I'm gonna say if we don't get more questions um, in the next, uh, we'll give it, just a minute here, but I think we've covered quite a bit. I don't think we have to, everybody's got a lot to do and hopefully you go to the 
Revolution Nothing Less show, watch it right now. Go to the Rise Up for Abortion Rights website right now. Sign up, get involved, print out some materials, spread them. Come to the walkouts tomorrow. And it's not too late to get people to walk out. And and adults can walk off the job too. One o'clock in New York City, one o'clock at Union Square is the convergence. There are other walkouts around the country. Um, And next Thursday, the nationwide shut it down. Start planning now, start spreading the word now, start fundraising now. Oh, we need people who can help do media outreach. There's all kinds of needs. So that's my uh, second big uh, kind of direction forward. And then the third is to echo what Michelle said. I want to, I really want to give special thanks to Revolution Books um, up in Harlem. If you are in the New York City area and you can get there, it is a must visit. You must shop there. You must buy your books, your gifts there. You must talk to the people there. Come find the Revolution Club there. It is uh, a Revolution Books is a bookstore for the world, about the world and for a radically new world. It's it's an unparalleled space. So. Um, I think maybe that's enough and we'll, and we'll thank everybody for tuning in. Anything else you want to say, Michelle? No, I just, I wanted to thank you, Sansara. I wanted to thank Revolution Books, everybody tuning in and sharing this, you know, um, share the video after this live stream is over, you know, um, and, you know, um, and I wanted to call on people to go to the website, revcom.us to read the whole of the piece that we've been talking about here today, right? From Baba Baki and the Supreme Court moves to end abortion rights taking to the streets and refusing to let this go down, right? And a lot more works from Baba Bakian and, and this movement for revolution and finding more about the Revolution Club, what it means to represent for this revolution and fight. And at the same time, as we're out there struggling and uniting with people to actually strengthen and, and, and fight to stop the Supreme Court from over, overturning Roe versus Wade. That's why I came to New York City all the way from LA to contribute to that. And, you know, and, and let's keep fighting and, and going forward. So good night.